Here is an operating room, one of the most mysterious places in the world because crazy things happen to your body and to your mind that don't happen anywhere else. But we take your memories away so that you don't remember what happened in that moment, in that altered state of consciousness. And is that trip that you're having under anesthesia, the emotions that come out, the aggression, the crying, maybe the dreams or nightmares, is that the same as a psychedelic trip like with magic mushrooms or other psychedelic substances? Here is one of those mysterious anesthetic substances. This one's called propofol or the milk of amnesia. Here's another one here called nitrous oxide or N2O. This is also called laughing gas, another one of those kind of psychedelic anesthetic substances, similar to ketamine or the ether-based gases like you see here, sevoflurane and desflurane. How similar are these trips to psychedelic trips? Can they be used to heal you the way that some psychedelics might be able to? Let's talk about the mind-altering properties of anesthesia versus psychedelics to learn how they might be able to help heal us from debilitating conditions like depression, anxiety, PTSD, or pain, and how they might hurt us by giving us bad trips or bad experiences, even in operating rooms like this one. Medicine's greatest secret is our inner healing potential, and it's most powerful under anesthesia. When we let go of the reality, we think we know. Anesthesia modulates the nerves in your whole body, not only your brain, but also all your muscles, your heart, pretty much anywhere in your body. Psychedelics are a little different in that we believe that they mostly affect the nerves in your brain responsible for their psychedelic trips or experiences. At high enough doses, anesthesia is kind of like a sledgehammer. It literally turns off all the nerves in your body. And that's why we need very special equipment like the ventilator here, like the breathing tubes here, the laryngoscopes to actually place those breathing tubes in your mouth when you're under anesthesia. And we have all sorts of other tools to make sure that it's used safely, like all the medications here to manage your heart and the other muscles in your body that are affected by anesthesia. All these pumps here to make sure we're giving you the exact right doses of anesthesia when you're on the operating room table for your surgery. Because anesthesia is preventing you from breathing. It's literally turning off the nerves that control your brain, telling your body to breathe. That's how powerful and potent anesthetics are at high enough doses. That's different than psychedelics, which like I said, are more experiential rather than that sledgehammer that turns off the nerves in your body. There are some other really important differences, like what happens to your memories with anesthesia versus psychedelics. Because anesthesia at high enough doses also turns off the memory formation parts of your brain. And that's different than mushrooms or other psychedelics that allow you to remember your experience. That's one reason why they might be therapeutically helpful because you don't forget the trip or experience that you had. And like we said, psychedelics are typically less sedating at the normally used doses versus anesthetics. That being said, anesthesia can still give you experiences that you can remember if the dose is low enough. Low doses of anesthetics like nitrous oxide or laughing gas or ketamine can still allow you to remember the experience, which can also help that be potentially healing when used in the right medically supervised setting. Anesthetics and psychedelics also affect the brains in some similar and in some different ways. A lot of patients ask me if they can be dreaming when they're in a room like this, under the lights here on the table. The answer is yes, but anesthesia doesn't allow for a REM-like sleep, so it's not a true dream-like state. More interestingly, there's a part of the brain called the default mode network. It's actually a network of different parts of the brain that is active when we're doing autopilot tasks, like driving down the highway, or we believe it's also active when we're stuck in inwardly focused loops of perseveration and rumination. That's what underlies depression and anxiety. We're literally on autopilot thinking about the same tragedies, the same stressful thoughts over and over again. It appears like the default mode network, which is involved in self-referential thinking, looking at ourself, what some philosophers might want to call the ego, is active when we're in autopilot. 
And that default mode network is disrupted by psychedelic substances and possibly some anesthetics. It actually happens because it reduces blood flow to some parts of the brain that are involved with that default mode network. So if you think about it, it might be turning off the parts of our brain that are involved with our autopilot behaviors, and those autopilot behaviors might be involved with some of our stressful thoughts, especially if we're stuck in autopilot thinking about those harmful self inward focused thoughts. Depression if it's of the past, anxiety if it's of the future. And that's where low dose anesthetics, in particular ketamine, have some similarities to psychedelic experiences in their trips, especially if used at doses that allow us to remember the experience in the future. Not necessarily at doses used for general anesthesia when you have that breathing tube down your throat and when you're that deep under anesthesia, you're typically not remembering the experience. So it's inherently difficult to say if that experience was healing or not because you can't remember it the way you could with a trip from mushrooms, for example, where you're conscious and still forming new memories throughout that process. Another big point here is emotions because so many patients wake up on this table crying or aggressive and saying things that they ordinarily wouldn't say either before they fall asleep or when they're waking up because their brain isn't fully online yet after general anesthesia. Psychedelics are kind of similar in that some experiences that arise might cause us to cry uncontrollably, to feel connected with the world around us, what we believe to be one of the therapeutic mechanisms for how they help us with depression. PTSD or other serious mental health conditions. Anesthesia and psychedelics might be a little bit different in how they reveal these emotions within us or open us up to them. And unfortunately, with higher doses of anesthesia, it's just hard to tell if they're actually helping us heal or if it's just our brain waking up from the medical coma that anesthesia puts us in versus us getting deeply in touch with those memories. Once again, some of the big exceptions are ketamine, maybe nitrous oxide, or low-dose propofol. It's all dependent on the dose of the anesthesia that allows the memories to be formed and had moving forward to potentially use as a therapeutic anchor. And those dreams and visions, it's really interesting because REM sleep has a lot of similarities to the expansive consciousness of psychedelic states or anesthesia. But like I said, the brain doesn't perfectly mimic REM sleep under anesthesia, and there are some other similarities and differences when compared to the brain under a psychedelic experience. That being said, all three may have healing or potentially hurting properties if they're not used or practiced properly. Another really common question is what opens up when you're under anesthesia or having that psychedelic experience? And a lot of things can open up partly because the frontal lobes of the brain are turned off to allow self inhibitions to go away. Those self inhibitions might stop us from saying or doing funny things, but those self inhibitions may also provide a source of negative self talk, inhibiting our potential to dig in deeper within ourselves to ultimately tap into our inner healing potential to heal ourselves. And lastly, one of the most important points is the environment that you're having this experience in. If it's anesthesia, usually it's in a medical office or an operating room. If it's a psychedelic, sometimes it's in a rave or in a loud concert setting, lots of lights, loud music, and these can fundamentally change what that experience is turning it from a potentially healing experience to one that might cause a bad trip or a nightmare or one that hurts us deep down. This is why the environment is so important, why medical supervision is key to having a healing experience, especially if we want to tap in to our subconscious, where those inwardly focused, ruminating and perseverating loops are spinning deep down in our heart or brains, wherever you believe that they reside. And by tapping into that subconscious level of thinking with either anesthetics or psychedelics, we can heal them, but the environment has to facilitate it. I'm not advocating for illegal use of any of these substances. In the right professional medical setting, a healing setting doesn't have to be an operating room. In my ketamine infusion clinic, we have very strict medical preparation and supervision, 
but not in a sterile environment like this one, to allow my patients to heal themselves at that subconscious level from those loops of perseveration and rumination that underlie so much of our pains, physical and emotional. And that is how psychedelics and anesthetics can be used to facilitate us tapping into our inner healing potential, even at that subconscious level, to conquer some of the most challenging conditions that we know in medicine.